Step into a horrifying moment frozen in time. It's the year 1953, and the London police respond to a tenant's call where they uncover a nightmarish scene. Bodies are discovered hidden in a secret kitchen nook beneath the floorboards and buried in the garden nearby. By then, the police were certain about the man they were after. They had encountered him three years earlier, connected to a different series of murders, but had been unable to charge him. Join us as Vice Confidential shares the disturbing tale of a seemingly unassuming neighbor whose double life would unveil a blood-soaked tapestry of murder, manipulation, and a descent into madness. This is a story that will grip your imagination and haunt your thoughts long after you experience it. Welcome to the case of serial killer John Christie. Our story begins in the quiet village of North Aurum, nestled in the heart of West Riding of Yorkshire, England. It was a chilly April day in 1899 when John Reginald Christie took his first breath. Christie's childhood was far from paradise. He was the sixth of seven children, born into a household full of violence, where his father, mother, and older sisters beat him mercilessly. The scars of his upbringing ran deep, leaving him with trauma not only on his skin, but also on his psyche. The torment he endured made it nearly impossible for him to forge meaningful friendships, and his confidence only weakened as he got older. A pivotal moment came when he was just eight years old, standing before his grandfather's lifeless body in a casket. The man who had instilled fear in him for much of his early life was now reduced to a mere shell. This encounter sparked a strange fascination within Christie, and one that would haunt him for the rest of his life. As the years went by, Christie's troubles took an even darker turn. His struggles with intimacy grew, likely due to the abuse during his childhood, and made for serious relationship problems. The word spread, and he came to be called Can't Do It Christie, a name that tortured him throughout his life and spawned a deep-seated hatred towards women. Eventually, the battles of World War I came calling, and Christie enlisted in the British Army, joining the ranks of the 52nd Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire Regiment. The war took a heavy toll on him, both physically and mentally. He claimed to have been left behind and mute by a mustard gas attack, although this was never confirmed by official medical records. His return from the battlefield was marked by a nasty marriage to his wife Ethel in 1920, a union that was anything but blissful. Christie's struggles with impotence persisted, driving a wedge between him and Ethel. The demons within pushed him towards a path of criminality. Stealing postal orders and committing other small crimes marked the beginning of his downward spiral. Christie moved on to regularly hiring prostitutes, the only women he could be sexually active with, as the feeling of ownership over them sparked his arousal. He found himself in jail on many occasions for offenses such as stealing a priest's car, burglarizing a theater, and even assaulting a woman with a cricket bat. Soon after, the bonds of marriage crumbled and Ethel left her husband to wrestle with the issues alone. It was at 10 Rillington Place where Christie's true nature emerged with stunning clarity. Between the years 1943 and 1953, the house bore witness to a series of unspeakable acts. Christie's lust and depravity led him down a path of violent sexual advances and murder, leaving the lives of more than eight women brutally extinguished. In the summer of 1943, Christie invited a prostitute named Ruth First into his home. The boundaries between pleasure and violence blurred in an instant as Christie's hands became instruments of death. They tightened around Ruth's throat like a rope and strangled the life out of her. Afterwards, Christie locked her body away under the floorboards. As the seasons came and went, so did Christie's bloodlust. In the fall of 1944, he ensnared another victim, a colleague named Muriel Aidy. Her vulnerability became his weapon as he lured her in with the promise of a miraculous cure for her bronchitis. The promise proved to be nothing more than a veil to conceal his true intentions. Using knockout gas, Christie rendered Muriel unconscious and took advantage of her while she slept, before ending her life. But this was just the beginning. Over the course of nine long years, Christie's reign of terror escalated and the list of victims grew. Rita Nelson, Kathleen Maloney, Hectorina McLennan, and even his own wife, Ethel, who had paid dearly for returning to him. Yet, amidst this trail of horrors, the darkest chapter of all was yet to unfold. The year 1948 brought together two households destined to collide. Timothy Evans and his wife, Beryl, settled into the flat just above John and Ethel Christie. 
not knowing that they had just made the biggest mistake of their lives. The couple was preoccupied with their already rocky marriage, which teetered on the brink of collapse as the weight of parenthood came down upon them. Timothy Evans, a man from South Wales, carried a burdensome past. The absence of his biological father and his struggles with health issues cast a shadow over his early years. His battle with illness led to a fractured education, leaving him without basic literacy skills. Part of his life was spent toiling away in the depths of the Methier coal mines before he migrated to the sprawl of London in 1939, seeking a safe space with his mother and her new husband. In the bustling heart of the city, Timothy Evans underwent a transformation, using various identities to fit into a world that often seemed foreign. What he told people often became grandiose, blurring the lines between reality and fiction, as he shifted between a Welsh accent and one of a London native. These changes, which originated from his insecurity and a need to conform, hinted at a deeper struggle within. A twist of fate brought Beryl Thorley into Timothy's life in 1946, and their marriage followed a year later. Yet, the promise of happiness was soon eclipsed by their own demons. Financial strife gripped them, and Timothy's battle with alcoholism added fuel to the flames. The birth of their daughter, Geraldine, in the cramped quarters of 10 Rillington Place, only made their situation increasingly miserable. The couple then made a decision that would forever alter the course of their lives. Beryl, grappling with the news of another pregnancy, found herself considering an abortion. Despite the illegal nature of the act, the couple was committed to going through with it. This is where they made a deal with the devil, known as John Christie, who emerged from the shadows and offered to perform the abortion. Here, Timothy Evans and John Christie became ever more entwined, leading to a climax that would shock the world and leave an unmistakable mark on true crime history. Before we continue, please take a moment to support our channel by liking this video, subscribing, and ringing the bell to receive notifications of all of our newest videos covering the most captivating true crime cases of the past and the present. Now, let's get back to the story. A few weeks later, the air hung heavy with suspicion as Timothy Evans, a man plagued by contradictions, became the center of attention. The sudden disappearance of his wife, shrouded in a cloak of mystery, had thrust him into the heart of a gripping police investigation. Under the watchful eyes of law enforcement, Evans' narrative morphed with each passing moment. The tale he first spun unveiled a desperate attempt to end his wife's pregnancy that ended in tragedy. Yet, as investigators combed the surroundings for traces of validity, their efforts proved fruitless. Next, Evans cast accusations toward his neighbor, John Christie. In this account, Christie had offered his barbaric solution to their predicament. Evans recounted how he had returned from work one day, only to be greeted with a bloody revelation. Beryl had perished under Christie's knife during the procedure. He then told Evans to leave town for a while, and that he would make sure Geraldine was taken care of until his return. Fear and desperation propelled Evans to retreat to his homeland in Wales, leaving behind a trail of uncertainty and heartache. But once he was back in London, Christie forbid him from seeing his daughter. As the puzzle pieces fell into place, the grim truth emerged. The walls of a wash house behind 10 Rillington Place concealed a gruesome secret, the lifeless bodies of Beryl and her daughter, Geraldine. Evan's resolve unraveled further as his confessions tumbled out. Guilt seemed to weigh heavily upon his shoulders. A simple, yes, yes, he uttered to the authorities, sealed his fate as the prime suspect. The judicial system sprang into motion, and Evans found himself caught up in a trial that would captivate the public. His defense was a desperate plea, pointing the accusing finger towards Christie, a man with a past of his own. The courtroom crackled with tension as Christie's words fell like a curtain, casting doubt upon the credibility of Evans' claims. Yet, Christie's past, stained with a history of crime, remained hidden. To the untrained eye, it appeared that he had mended his ways and stood reformed. The scales of justice swayed, and the jury's deliberations bore heavy consequence. After three days of deliberation, a verdict emerged for Timothy Evans. Guilty. Attempts at redemption fell short, as an appeal was quickly dismissed by the so-called evidence. The day of the gallows for the accused came swiftly and the walls of Pentonville Prison bore witness to an execution that would not soon be forgotten. Timothy Evans' neck snapped at the end of the hangman's noose, 
but the real culprit still walked the streets of London a free man. Time marched forward, and three years elapsed in the dim corridors of the apartment complex that sheltered John Christie's devious secrets. The specter of his evil deeds lingered, lurking beneath the surface as life went on around him. This all came to a halt one day when the landlord granted another tenant access to Christie's kitchen, and within its confines, his diabolical schemes finally came to light. Hidden away in the depths of a pantry were three lifeless bodies, mute witnesses to their killer's depravity. The air grew heavy with foreboding as the police descended upon the scene. Beneath the creaking floorboards, three more corpses were discovered. Among them laid Ethel, Christie's own wife. The same court that witnessed the fall of Timothy Evans now became the stage for Christie's own reckoning. As the trial developed, a surprising confession pierced the silence. Christie admitted to the murder of Beryl Evans, a starting revelation that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. While he was held accountable for Ethel's murder, a lingering question remained. Was Christie truly the malevolent puppeteer behind Evans' fate? Doubt circulated amidst this courtroom drama. Christie's insanity plea muddled his confession, making it obvious that this was a calculated move to sway the proceedings in his favor. The public's collective gaze turned towards his history of crime, which breathed new life into Timothy Evans' case. Neglected evidence and overlooked details painted a damning portrait of Christie, whose grip on the washhouse key confirmed his role in the murders. July 15, 1953 marked the end of John Christie's dark saga, as justice was delivered in the form of a hangman's noose. The echoes of the past intertwined with the present, when the very same hand that executed Timothy Evans now brought Christie's morbid tale to an equally violent end. Through twists and turns, injustices righted, and secrets unveiled, we've journeyed deep into the heart of a true crime narrative that defies comprehension. As Vice Confidential closes this chapter, we're left with a somber understanding that within the ordinary, the extraordinary can hide, and that the pursuit of truth is a relentless endeavor that can illuminate even the darkest corners of our shared history. Until next time, keep your curiosity high and your thirst for knowledge unquenchable, as you never know what your neighbors have to hide. Stay safe, and we'll see you on the other side.